Thank you, Dr. Allegretti. My name is Sahil Khanna. I'm a professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. In the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk on a topic titled as Diagnosing C. diff in Inflammatory Bowel Disease, Challenges and Pitfalls. The outline of my presentation includes epidemiology and pathophysiology of C. difficile in inflammatory bowel disease. I'll talk about the risk factors and most importantly, the outcomes of C. diff in inflammatory bowel disease. And I'll end with the diagnostic considerations for C. diff in inflammatory bowel disease. We'll start with the patient case to set up the stage. This is a 40 year old male who has ulcerative colitis and is managed well on a 5-ASA agent. He presents to an emergency room with diarrhea and blood in stool, dehydrated, the abdomen is tender and you make a decision to admit him to the hospital. The next step there is to obtain stool studies and you're thinking about an infection which most commonly complicates inflammatory bowel disease and that is C. diff infection. Studies have shown that there is an overall increasing burden of C. difficile in inflammatory bowel disease patients. This study more than a decade ago now looked at the percentage of patients who were having inflammatory bowel disease and C. diff infection concomitantly and were seen. Here you see in the gray bars that the total number of C. diff patients that were seen were increasing, but this fraction of patients who had IBD in addition to C. diff also increased from 4% in 2003 to 16% in 2005, making it a fourfold increase in the proportion of patients with C. diff who have inflammatory bowel disease. Similar data have also been seen from national data sets. This are data from National Hospital Discharge Survey, where we see that C. diff actually affects ulcerative colitis more than Crohn's disease. On the y-axis, you see here cases per 10,000 hospitalizations. And we see in the gray bars that ulcerative colitis is more common comorbidity with C. diff infection compared to Crohn's disease suggesting that patients with colonic involvement in inflammatory bowel disease have a higher likelihood of C. diff infection. Now, within that population of ulcerative colitis, when you break that down with age, you're seeing that the incidence is highest in age over 85, but you are seeing patients who are younger who also have C. diff infection when they have underlying ulcerative colitis, suggesting that younger people with inflammatory bowel disease also tend to develop C. diff infection. There have been more and more hospitalizations in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease and underlying dysbiosis due to inflammatory bowel disease that leads to C. diff infection. This graph here shows proportion of C. diff assisted hospitalizations on the y-axis and the x-axis is years. And the top line demonstrates that the highest incidence is in ulcerative colitis and the bottom line depicts the lower incidence is in Crohn's disease, but you can see that the trends show that the proportion of patients with C. diff who get hospitalized who have inflammatory bowel disease is continuing to increase. Let's talk a little bit about risk factors and pathophysiology and compare patients with and without IBD who have C. diff infection. In terms of patient characteristics, patients with IBD tend to be younger than patients who do not have IBD and get C. diff infection. IBD patients with C. diff infection are less likely to be exposed to antibiotics compared to those who don't have IBD. And they're more likely to have community onset infection compared to patients without inflammatory bowel disease. Now, when we do see patients with C. diff infection, there is a risk of recurrence. And the risk of recurrence is actually higher in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease compared to patients who do not have inflammatory bowel disease. And this is because there is persistent dysbiosis due to underlying inflammatory bowel disease and dysbiosis of the gut microbiome tends to be a risk factor for C. diff infection. When you compare that to patients who don't have IBD, if there is no more antibiotic exposure, they have a lower recurrence rate. Compared to patients who do have inflammatory bowel disease, you see a higher recurrence rate of C. diff infection after the infection has resolved. So why does this happen? This is a cartoon that demonstrates the difference between inflammatory bowel disease in terms of gut homeostasis and comparing that to IBD. You see here on the left that there, when in the gut homeostatic state, there is an intact inner mucous layer. The outer mucous layer is intact and the intestinal lumen has 
eubiosis, which has colonization resistance and does not allow C. diff to colonize or produce infection. Now, in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, due to the upstream inflammation that happens with TNF and other mediators, there is a disruption of the mucus layer. And owing to the host genetics, owing to diet, owing to sometimes antibiotic exposure, but mostly due to the inflammatory ca cascade, there is gut dysbiosis. This gut dysbiosis is persistent and is associated with decreased clostridia, decreased firmicutes, and other bacterial taxa that decrease. Now, when these bacterial taxa decrease, there is actually increased perception or increased predisposition to getting C. diff infection due to decreased colonization resistance. When you treat C. diff infection, this gut dysbiosis actually persists and there is a higher risk of recurrence. So what are the risk factors for C. diff infection and inflammatory bowel disease? Top risk factors include antibiotics. So you've got already dysbiosis, you give antibiotics, you lead to more dysbiosis leading to C. diff infection. Having a history of C. diff infection is a very important risk factor. As I'd mentioned earlier, colonic involvement with inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's colitis more than Crohn's ileitis, and ulcerative colitis more than Crohn's disease tends to be risk factors for C. diff and IBD. The more active your IBD is, the higher the dysbiosis, and that leads to getting a predisposition to C. diff infection. Studies have shown that immunosuppression, especially biologics, are a risk factor for C. diff infection. And other traditional risk factors such as chemotherapy, hospitalization, long-term care facility residence, and surgery tend to be risk factors for C. diff and inflammatory bowel disease. When you do have a patient with IBD who ends up getting C. diff, it is very important for us to discuss adverse outcomes with those patients and manage those patients very aggressively. Several healthcare adverse outcomes have been identified and studied. These patients tend to have a longer hospital stay. C. diff and IBD have two to four days longer hospital stay than patients who do not have C. diff infection. There's a fourfold higher mortality. These patients are less likely to respond to the traditional IBD therapies that we have. In the year after, when they get C. diff infection, patients with IBD have a higher risk of colectomy or other surgeries due to inflammatory bowel disease flares. Health economic wise, these patients have more emergency room visits, more hospitalizations, and more readmissions. And they tend to have higher healthcare costs. Studies have shown that the cost in ulcerative colitis can increase by 49% and more than 67% in patients with Crohn's disease. So C. diff tends to be a very, very serious infection in patients who have underlying inflammatory bowel disease. Moving on to some other adverse outcomes. The studies have shown that there are subsequent IBD flares and there's a need to escalate IBD therapy in patients who get C. diff infection. And then finally, as I had mentioned earlier, there are higher recurrences in patients who have C. diff and IBD compared to C. diff without IBD. And IBD patients are 33% more likely to experience recurrent C. diff infection. Risk factors for recurrence in this situation include exposure to antibiotics, 5-ASA agents have been implicated, steroids, which we end up using commonly in this situation and certain biologics, and fliximab more than alimumab in one study. And then colonic Crohn's disease tends to have a high risk of recurrence in patients with C. diff who have underlying infl inflammatory bowel disease. Taking that forward, there are several diagnostic dilemmas for patients who have C. diff and have underlying inflammatory bowel disease. And these diagnostic dilemmas are present because symptoms overlap considerably. Patients with C. diff tend to have diarrhea. Patients with inflammatory bowel disease tend to have diarrhea. And it's not possible to distinguish sometimes based on symptoms because blood and stool can happen in C. diff with IBD and can happen in IBD without C. diff infection. Additionally, when you look at endoscopic features, they're not very reliable. The pictures here demonstrate on the left what does C. diff look like without inflammatory bowel disease? And you see pseudomembranes. Sometimes you see severe colonic inflammation without pseudomembranes in patients who have C. diff but do not have inflammatory bowel disease. Now, pictures on the right demonstrate what does the colon look like in patients who have ulcerative colitis and have C. diff infection or patients who have Crohn's colitis and have C. diff infection. You would see typically the absence of pseudomembranes. So pseudomembranes are not seen in this situation. Endoscopically, when you scope these patients, it's impossible to distinguish 
if this is an ulcerative colitis flare due to C. diff infection, or if this is a colitis flare in the absence of C. diff infection. So endoscopic findings are not very helpful. Moving forward, even if we take biopsies, in the biopsies, you would not see pseudomembranous changes. And then a pathologist is not gonna be able to let you know if this is C. diff complicating inflammatory bowel disease, or if this is inflammatory bowel disease flare without C. diff infection. So your symptoms overlap, endoscopic and histological features are not reliable in this situation. Additionally, even if you check a fecal calprotectin, that's not gonna be helpful for you to distinguish C. diff infection with IBD from IBD flare itself. However, since C. diff has so many adverse outcomes and is the most common infection in patients with IBD, all IBD patients with a flare should be tested for C. diff infection. So how do we do that? Stool tests for the C. diff bacterium are the way to go in this situation, but there are several considerations and this is the most important part of my talk. I would say that the PCR, which is the most commonly used test, is more than 95% sensitive to detect the C. diff bacterium. Unfortunately, the PCR only detects the presence of the bacterium. It does not detect toxin production. And the positive predictive value of the PCR, despite the test being positive, is dependent on symptoms. Here, you really can't distinguish symptoms at times because symptoms are overlapping. When symptoms overlap, in patients who have more than one cause of diarrhea, such as C. diff and IBD, the highly sensitive PCR assay ends up having a low positive predictive value because you cannot rely on symptoms. When you see a positive PCR in an IBD patient, always think, is the C. diff a colonizer? And is there no toxin production? And a positive PCR in this situation could be clinically irrelevant. So what do we do? We think about using an EIA-based assay. Now an EIA-based assay can detect toxin A and toxin B. If you just try to detect toxin A and toxin B, the IA assay would have a low sensitivity, but does have a high specificity. So if you use the EIA alone, you may end up missing cases. And traditionally we used to say, measure the EIA for toxin A and toxin B three times. And if it's negative three times, you call it no C. diff infection. More recently, a two-step algorithm comprising of glutamate dehydrogenase and EIA for toxin A and toxin B is the desirable way to go. And why is this important? Studies have shown that if you are toxin positive, compared to if you're toxin negative and PCR positive, you have a higher response to antibiotics, suggesting that if you're toxin negative and PCR positive, you could potentially be colonized. So what is this two-step algorithm? Let's go over this. If you have a patient in whom symptoms are suggestive of C. diff infection, the first step is to obtain the GDH or glutamate dehydrogenase by an EIA. Now GDH is highly sensitive, but not specific for C. diff infection. So then you have to move that to a second test, and that is the EIA for toxin A and B. When you combine both of these together, and if the GDH is positive and the EIA is positive, you diagnose that person with C. diff infection. However, we know that the EIA has low sensitivity. So what if the GDH is positive and the EIA is negative, then you have to use a tiebreaker test, which would be a PCR-based assay. And you have to make sure the patient does have symptoms that are suggestive of C. diff infection. When you obtain that PCR-based assay and it ends up being positive, you say that GDH and EI are discordant. Since C. diff has so many adverse events with IBD, in that case, you would diagnose C. diff infection and treat as such. Now, if you have a GDH positive, EIA negative, and you obtain a PCR, and that is negative, in that case, you say the GDH could be a false positive and you would rule out C. diff infection in that situation. Now, sometimes when you measure a GDH, it turns out to be negative. Depending on the algorithm of the lab, if it's negative, you could directly rule out C. diff infection, but most labs end up following a negative GDH assay with an EIA for toxin A and B. And when you do a GDH negative and you do an EIA test, the majority of times it's gonna be negative and you would rule out C. diff infection. However, sometimes you see, and that's rare, you see a negative GDH assay and a positive EIA. In that case, you obtain a PCR and then based on what the PCR shows, you decide if it's C. diff infection versus not. So putting all of this together, when you do have a patient with inflammatory bowel disease in whom you're considering C. diff infection, step one, record their baseline IBD symptoms and record what symptoms do they have with a flare. 
Step two, look at your lab and see what modality is available for C. diff testing. If it's the GDH, toxin A and B, that's a preferred two-step algorithm. If it's a PCR, you could do that, but make sure that you're thinking about false positives. And if it's just an EIA for toxin A and B, make sure that you understand this could have low sensitivity. If you test a patient who ends up being positive, then you treat based on guidelines. And Dr. Grinspan is going to go over that in his presentation today. However, after you've treated patients based on the guidelines, you end up reassessing those symptoms after treatment is finished or sometimes during treatment. If symptoms resolve or return to baseline at that time, do not test for cure because you could get false positive C. diff tests. However, if symptoms persist or return after improving, patients go back to the same algorithm where you're considering a recurrent C. diff infection in an inflammatory bowel disease patient. So in summary, I would say that C. diff infection is a common comorbidity in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and there is a higher risk in patients with colonic involvement, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis. C. diff inflammatory bowel disease is associated with several adverse outcomes, including IBD flares, higher rates of recurrence, higher mortality, non-response to IBD therapy, and need to escalate IBD therapy, making C. diff a very, very serious infection in patients who have underlying inflammatory bowel disease. In 2020 and moving on to 2021, diagnostic challenges still remain a conundrum in patients who have C. diff infection, who have underlying inflammatory bowel disease. This is because patients have overlapping symptoms. PCR, the most commonly used test, has high sensitivity but could be clinically false positive. And in most instances in these patients with overlapping symptoms, the two-step testing algorithm is likely the way to go. I'd like to thank all of you for your attention today. And I'm gonna pass this over to Dr. Ari Grinspan, who's gonna talk about treatment of C. diff infection in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease and the impact of COVID-19 to this patient population.